Those images you've just seen, the great military battles, the bombing, the triumphs and the victory, are what most of today's generation visualize when they think about World War II. But when I talk to others who have lived through those times, I find they have different memories. I hear the stories of the little triumphs, the individual sacrifices, and the personal war that was fought by our people. The following is dedicated as a tribute to all of you who were there, a collection preserved for future generations of a time which you and I will never forget. When Churchill said in his victory speech, this was your war, your victory, he was right. For without the spirit of the British people, it would have been a very different story. Hostilities will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight, Tuesday the 8th of May. But in the interest of saving lives, the ceasefire began yesterday to be sounded along all the fronts. The German war is therefore at an end. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. Today is victory in Europe day. me what I was doing on VE Day and I really wasn't doing anything. I was living in the country. Uh, I had been a bit prepared that uh, peace was coming because not long prior to that, uh, once again we'd been invited to Windsor Castle and it was a special little celebration party they said. So we said, why? What are we celebrating? So they said, well, you know, we think it'll be over pretty soon. So when it arrived I wasn't surprised. But I was living quietly in the country and uh, we just had a, a quiet celebration. But I know we'll meet again some sunny Throughout the nation, we celebrated a day of victory, a day to remember. But for all of us who lived through those times, just as with this family, at some time during the celebrating, there was a moment of reflection. Looking back now, not only was VE Day a day to remember, we had all gone through a war to remember. I always remember my father telling me, memories live longer than dreams. 
I never used to know what he was talking about, but now I do. I can't remember what dreams I had before the war. I remember the dreams I had during it, nightmares mostly. Or dreams of waking up one morning, the sun would be shining and it'd be all over. It's funny though, here we are, that day has come. Even the sun has managed to come out. The family's back together again. Well, most of them. This should be the time to dream of new beginnings, and yet all I can do is think of the many memories, good and bad. It's as though I can't forget. Perhaps I never will. Perhaps we never should. I suppose I must be one of the lucky ones. At least I'm here, alive and able to remember. I can remember the day I joined up. Victor came with me. What was I, 42, 43? My son, not yet 18. There we stood, dressed in our best suits, waiting to sign up for the army. Victor had wanted to sign on as well, <laughs> lie about his age. Olive would never have forgiven me. I'm glad we gave him a good education. It was almost a year later before he joined the Air Force. Dunkirk. I was so lucky. So many deaths. Just how many of my pals bought it then? God, some of them are so young. They should have been at school or college, not getting slaughtered on some godforsaken beach in France. What would Olive have done if I'd been one of them? I can't remember being hit. There I was, running along the beach. It was too quick to be frightened. I just knew I had to get clear. I remember now I thought I'd died. How long was I there? Then there was the ship. I was laying on a mattress, I think. I know I was in the open, so I must have been on the deck. There was so much noise and commotion going on. Yet, as I look back now, it seems so quiet and peaceful. They were dragging men out of the sea, hundreds of men, hundreds of boats. I felt then, and I still have the same feeling. We were all the lucky ones. It seems so long ago. Now here we all are, celebrating. Victor's home on leave. Surely it's all over for him too. God, I hope he hasn't bursted out to the Far East. He's fought enough. He's done his bit, we all have. And George, he had a hell of a time out in the desert. I always hoped Eileen would marry a gentleman. She picked a good one in George. Dear Eileen, she did her bit, slaving away in that aircraft factory, never giving up, living every day as it came, running to the door every time she heard the postman. I don't know how many letters George sent her, but she has kept every one of them. It wasn't all good news the postman brought, though. There was that day, a day I will never forget as long as I live. Margaret was here. Her and Tom hadn't been married more than a few months. He'd met her on shore leave in Portsmouth. She worked in the local cinema there. Poor Olive. She read that telegram over and over again. We regret to inform you that your son. God bless your son. You never had Victor's brains, but you made up for it with spirit. You were always your mother's favorite. That woman was probably the strongest one out of all of us over the past years. She fed us, clothed us, and kept this house immaculate, all with nothing. 
yet she still had the time and energy to carry out her war work. <laughs> I dread to think what would have happened if ever a Nazi had had the misfortune to come face to face with her. And what about William? What must he be thinking of all this? What horrors will he remember in years to come? What must he have thought of us, his parents, sending him away to live with strangers? It's been a tough time for all of us, but despite the hardship, despite the sorrow, despite the fear and anxiety, we came through and we've earned the right to feel bloody proud of ourselves. When the expeditionary force had retreated from Dunkirk across the Channel, we felt sure that the invasion of England would soon follow. I remember the feelings of relief that we all shared, relieved that so many of our men had got home safely. I also remember the sadness for those that didn't. And I will never forget the daunting pictures of Dunkirk printed in our local newspaper. I was in North Africa on my way home from uh, the Far East. I didn't realize at the time what was happening. All I knew that we were informed that something was happening and we all would hope that whatever was happening was going to be uh, the beginning of the end. And uh, we were in a little tent on the sands in a little uh, army tent and with just a handful of officers there. And uh, the news came over, the little radio, and we all raised our glasses. I think it was water because there certainly wasn't anything stronger and wished everybody good luck. For those soldiers who fought at Dunkirk and did get back, there was a reprieve. For the time being, at least, they were safe. But we soon learned that it was a different story for our airmen. They would have to defend the skies over Britain. I'm 24 years old next birthday. Somehow I feel much older. I remember when I volunteered to go on a bomber squadron. A group of us were in the mess, meeting for the first time. We were talking to a pilot who'd been on Wimpy's since the start of the war. He was talking about his crew, how he'd lost three rear gunners during his first tour in only three months. I'll never forget the look of horror among us new boys when he told us that the life expectancy of a gunner was so low, he'd be lucky if he survived more than three raids. What was it he said? The 27-year-old man is an old man in Bomber Command. I was glad I was a pilot. I used to dream of being a fighter pilot, like those chaps in the Battle of Britain, diving through the clouds in their powerful chariots all that speed at their fingertips, all that power. I met a couple of them once. They couldn't have been more than 18. That image will stay in my mind forever. One of them had been shot up over the south coast. He was flying a Spitfire and a 109 had taken a pot at him. A dreadful bad luck. When you're sitting behind a full tank of fuel and the flames start, there's not a lot of time to step out. He had broken one of the golden rules. In the panic, he took off his goggles and gloves. Flames did the rest. I met him a year after it had happened. He was still undergoing treatment at East Grinstead. I was there visiting a friend, Molly, the nurse. I wonder what happened to her. Where his eyes should have been, there were only slits. A tube of flesh protruded from his strapped up arm. It seemed to be connected to his face. It looked like the trunk of an elephant. I'd walked into Ward 3 looking for Molly. She was busy with another patient. He came up and asked if he could help me. Then he offered me a chair while I waited. Have a seat, old boy, he said. And he picked up a chair with his teeth and put it down beside me and then just smiled. I never complained about my lot again after that. Life wasn't too bad looking back. We had a lot of fun in the mess and... We could always go down to the pub for a pint and shoot a line to one of the local girls. 
Not like those chaps in the army or navy. They were stuck away from home for months and years. It was always on a knife edge, though, not knowing if the raid was going to be your last. The big raids were pretty hairy. So many aircraft in such a small sky. On the way back, I always thought about the hot breakfast. But once I saw the spire of Lincoln Cathedral, I knew we were safe. It did get a bit too close at times. There was a time we just landed after a raid over Berlin. Group wanted a volunteer crew to take a lank up on a solo reconnaissance mission. I volunteered, but so had Bill Edwards. They only wanted one crew, so we flipped a coin. I lost and Bill went. Bill's belongings were emptied from his room the next day. Life was that uncertain, I could have died on the flip of a coin. We had a job to do, we just got on with it. When I got the news that Tom had been killed in action, I was devastated. I didn't sleep all night. I remember falling asleep the next day during a briefing for that night's raid. I had to go up in front of the CO. He knew about my situation, but that didn't stop him hauling me over the coals. I felt sick when he told me, it's a bad business, but there's a war to fight. I couldn't believe anybody could be so callous. It was only a few days later when I unexpectedly received three days compassionate leave and a travel pass to get home. I turned up unannounced on Mum's birthday. She was really pleased to see me. Seems to see I wasn't such a bad old stick after all. I used to wonder how I'd feel when it was all over. If I made it. One raid more than any other sticks out in my mind. Only, we weren't carrying bombs. We were carrying food. Tons of it. Holland had been cut off by the Nazis and the people were literally starving to death. We flew in low over the treetops and dropped the food to the thousands of people who'd come out to greet us. We flew so close I could see their faces. We banked and turned and on the return pass, we could see that the Dutch had laid sheets on a road. It was some sort of sign. As we flew in low on a second pass, the sign simply read, thank you. If anyone ever asks me in the future what image sticks out most in my memories of the war, it has to be that day. It just made everything we'd gone through and all that we'd fought for seem worth it. One of the most recognisable wartime images for me and one of the most memorable men was Winston Churchill. For all of us, he represented the backbone of the nation and as the years go by, our memories fade. Of course, every now and then, I reflect on cherished moments from the past, and it's often the little things in life that we remember most. During the war, when we all had to manage and make do, those things which may seem trivial to a new generation played a very important part in all our lives. When all the skies are gray and it's a rainy day Think of the birdies in spring When you're up to your neck in hot water Be like the kettle and the sing Tell that umbrella man he's just an old so red Think of a kid on a swing When you're up to your neck in hot water be like the kettle and the sing You'll find that life's always got a funny side Smash and drop so tea there, sweetie. Over on the sunny side And wear a great big smile it Some of the happiest moments was entertaining people, keeping them happy in the, uh, in the theatre. Uh, when the raid had started and everybody stayed behind and we had a little party and a sing-song on the stage. There are many, many things that I do remember about the war, but I know I had to go to a recording studio one day, and it was just after a very, very bad night of the Blitz, and everywhere was so full of smoke and fire engines and hose pipes. You know, no matter where you went and how you struggled to get to work, everyone was doing the same. They were all out to say, well, everything's got to be kept going. And to see the, uh, the comradeship, the working together, and, and they were good times. I say, just a moment. Yes, both of you. 
You'll be getting a new ration book pretty soon now, and it'll save you a lot of time and trouble if the name and address and details are the same on your present ration book as they are on your identity card. I just thought I'd remind you, that's all. As far as rationing was concerned, I suppose I was fortunate. I had my mother who used to look after that side because I was working all the time. But of course, I do remember the five shilling meals that we could have. You couldn't buy a meal in a restaurant that cost more than five shillings. In fact, I remember going to the Savoy Hotel and having a meal for five shillings. I'd like to do that today. Also, the story about the little old lady that was uh, both sides of her house had been demolished, but there she was in the morning, whitening, which they used to do in those days, whitening her step. You know, whatever happens, I'm going to have a clean step to step over. Well, that is an example, really, of the kind of courage and fortitude of the people of Britain at that time. When your troubles are boiling over, Consult this recipe. Everybody will be in clover, happy as can be. When all the skies are gray and it's a rainy day, think of the birdies in spring. When you're up to your neck in hot water, be like the kettle and sing. Tell that umbrella man. He's just an old so man. Think of a kid on a swing. When you're up to your neck in the hot water, be like the kettle and sing. You'll find that life's always got a funny side. So come over on the sunny side and wear a great big smile. It makes your life worthwhile. You'll have the world on a string. When you're up to your neck in hot water, be like the kettle and sing. When Churchill became Prime Minister in 1940 and gave his first common speech, he offered us only blood, toil, sweat and tears. I never realised quite what he meant until September the 7th, 1940, the day the Blitz began. In the bleak days that followed, raids night after night, the spirit of the nation asserted itself. And from that time on, when the lights went out, we were determined to see it through.
women of Britain, a new era was dawning. We weren't just passive victims, we were able to take an active part in the war effort. For the first time, women had the opportunity to do things that they would never have thought possible before. The other day, we visited a West of England aerodrome where we saw a squad of WAF flight mechanics in business-like dungarees working on the engines of Avro Anson and Oxford aircraft. Smart young girls with a flair for engineering. Look at this lovely bit of work. She's a peach. Air-cooled with 350 horsepower in her cylinders. Out on the tarmac, we saw one of the test pilots giving a few words of advice. But not all their work is on the ground. With parachute packs in the right place, they set off for a flight to study engine performance. Whoops, Waff. Listening to the engine's heartbeats, watching the rev counter as the advanced trainer planes take off. At 1,000 feet, the girls have their eyes glued to the instrument panel and noting down the readings on their charts. Technical training spread over many months has turned these girls into first-class mechanics. Nice work, and girls can get it. Funny how sometimes it's the little things that you remember most. I'll never forget going into old Mr Cox's shop near the factory one lunchtime. George was coming home on leave, and I wanted to buy some elastic. We were going to spend a day together at Margate's. I didn't have a swimming costume, but I'd read how you could make one from an old vest. I asked Mr Cox for the elastic, and he just glared at me. Don't you know there's a war on, he said. It really infuriated me. Well, I told him, I'm well aware of that, thank you. My brother was killed protecting people like you. I regretted it afterwards, but there were so many frustrations it just felt good to let off steam once in a while. Then there was the time I took William into the same shop. He couldn't have been more than six. I was so embarrassed when he shouted at the top of his voice in front of all of the other customers. What have you got under the counter today, Mr Cox? Then there was the time I was going to work one morning. The raids had been really heavy and we'd spent the night in the shelter. I turned the corner and there was no shop anymore, just rubble. The thing I remember the most was seeing a shoe among the debris. It looked so pathetic. I cried all the way to work. George's letters meant so much to me. I used to watch the postman go on his round after he'd delivered my letter and wondered what bad news he was carrying for some poor soul. He must have dreaded his work some days. I remember my first day at the factory. The foreman swearing. What was it he said? Not more bloody women. We soon showed him. We did as much as any of the men. They still used to get paid more than us though. Perhaps that will all change one day. Lunch times were fun, all the girls together. We were always talking about our husbands or boyfriends, sharing any news, telling each other stories about the raids. The concerts were a bit boring sometimes, especially the classical ones. I never did tell Mum where I got the cloth for my new red dress. I stole one of the flags off the canteen stage. We had a gramophone club. We all chipped in tuppence a week to buy the latest songs. Then there were the dances, all the girls from the factory, we were all dance crazy. All the boys in their crisp uniforms, they were so smart. Especially the Yanks, they were something special, exciting and full of clever talk. The nights I had to scurry home in the blackout. Good old mum, she never asked any questions. Dad would have had a fit if he'd known about Hank. I wonder where he thought all the cigarettes, sweets and scented soap came from. Perhaps he did know after all. What a handsome man that Hank was. So full of life. Such a waste. It was weeks before I found out what had happened to him. Now just another statistic. 
one of the ones that didn't come back. I never could tell George. Maybe one day. How would he have felt if I'd written him a Dear John letter? George used to tell me about how his pals felt stuck at the front line far away from home and their sweethearts. In his letters, he used to tell me that nothing upset a soldier so much as a letter from their loved ones saying they'd met somebody new. I remember reading Leonora's agony column in Women's Own. A girl had written in asking, should I kiss and tell? Leonora's answer was no. Wait and don't tell yet. Perhaps things will get better now that we're no longer apart. Poor George, what horrors he must have seen. He's been home for three days now, but he hasn't slept for more than an hour without waking up in a cold sweat. Here I am, home on leave, celebrating. But what is there for me to celebrate? The images from these past weeks will be with me to the day I die. So many emotions in such a short space of time. The fear when we enter the camp, wondering what to expect, waiting for the sniper's gunshot. The horror when we found what those huts concealed. The revulsion that a human being could do such a thing to a fellow man. The sorrow, the pity for all those wretched women and children. And then the anger, an uncontrollable urge to lynch every Nazi in sight. For as long as I live, I will never understand how it was allowed to happen. Surely the people must have known it was going on. Why? Why? Very few people in this country went untouched by the inevitable loss of life that comes with war. Just as this family lost a son in battle, we all suffered many unhappy times of real sadness, grieving over the loss of loved ones. We were both so young. 
We never really had time to get to know each other. I'll never forget the day we parted. Standing on the dockside, waving goodbye. I felt that my heart went with you, hoping that somehow it would keep you safe. I remember anxiously watching the newsreels at the cinema every day, just in case there was a mention of your ship. <laughs> there never was. But I did see many stories of the sea war. I used to imagine what I would have felt if it had been pictures of your ship that I was watching. And shows the last of Bismarck shells bursting before she sank. But the fact remains, the Bismarck was sent to the bottom. A hundred or so survivors being picked up out of her total complement of about 2,000. The remnant which go to an internment camp may now ruminate on the fact that the 35,000 ton pride of Hitler was only on the high seas for a week when she met her doom. Seeing all those newsreels of the war, day in, day out, made me feel inadequate. I felt that I wanted to make some contribution, to help in some way. When we got the news on that terrible day, I remember making up my mind there and then. I was going to do something worthwhile, not just for me, not just for the war effort, but also for you, Tom. National importance. They'll be required for the Auxiliary Territorial Service, Women's Auxiliary Air Force, Women's Royal Naval Service, the Land Army, Nursing, Munitions and the other services. Many of the girls like the idea of a uniform, anxious to cock a military cap over the eye, no doubt. Well, if you doubt your girlfriend's age, see what call-up she attends. D-Day was the most exciting day of my life. All the south of England was alive with troops. Every road was full of trucks. I watched them pouring onto the ships. Nursing in the hospitals had been rewarding, but I remember thinking then, this was really going to be my chance to do something worthwhile. It was midnight before we set sail. Nobody slept. That eerie silence, I can picture it now. Dawn was just breaking, then the sound of the chains. We were anchoring. I could see the coast of France. Everywhere around us were hundreds of ships. The troops disembarked, but we stayed on board until nightfall. Then there was the sound, a sound I will never forget. The soft thud of boots, soldiers marching, their silhouettes picked out by the moonlight. Then came the whistling. Hundreds and hundreds of marching feet and the men whistling and singing as they marched. I felt sick. I couldn't help thinking then of the ones that would never return. Then I thought of you, Tom, and I was no longer afraid. The hospital was up and running within six hours of landing and the first casualties were coming in. My first patient, that poor bombardier, blood pouring from his wounds, Laying on the stretcher, he looked so pathetic, probably no more than 18 or so. I remember him looking up at me. Thinking back, I must have looked like a boy with my hair tied up. I tried to comfort him, telling him he was safe now. I told him I was an English nurse and I was going to look after him. The poor soul. He had only one arm, the other was a mass of ripped flesh. But he raised his good arm and cheered. Lads, we're home. We're safe. He was so happy, so relieved. He had tears of joy streaming down his cheeks. Then he reached out and held my hand, and I cried with him. It was a good feeling knowing that in some way you were bringing comfort to those that really did need it. When war broke out, I thought my singing career had ended. I never imagined that in the years to come, I would be able to reach out to so many people and bring joy to those that were separated and far away. Perhaps my greatest experience of being able to do something was when I visited the frontline troops in Burma in 1944.
after a while when I was doing all my broadcasts here and doing the theatres, I thought that I would like to go somewhere and actually entertain the boys themselves. So I went to Drury Lane where Ensa was situated and said I'd like to go somewhere. So they said, where? So I said, well, where, where do they have the least entertainment? So they said, Burma. So I thought, well, yes, if that's where it's necessary, I shall go there. And so, of course, I did, and something I, I shall always be look back on and, and be so thankful that I had the opportunity to be able to do something like that, to actually be with the boys up in the front and to feel their appreciation and to see what they went through and, and sad also to see the, the conditions that they were fighting in and the hospitals, the kind of tents that they had to be nursed in. And sad afterwards to hear about some of the boys that I met and sang to just didn't get back home. I should always be grateful for the opportunity of being able to do something like that. Entertainment played such an important role during the war, keeping our spirits up and our morale high. I should be here in battle dress. You know, when I left England to come and work for Ensign, I said, uh, you'll have to wear a battle dress. I said, well, what's the idea? I mean, after all, I, I'm an actor, not a soldier. So I said, well, you'll have to wear a battle dress because if you get captured by the Germans, they'll shoot you. I said, if the Germans capture me, they're entitled to shoot me. <laughs> if I'm alone with a bottle of port, there's a distant story to tell. Though I'm still quite early, I'm not very well. and I knocked on a door and a dear old lady came to the door, a nice lady, a little bit and some more, not quite so much, and then perhaps. <laughs> and that's all I want, just a little encouragement. I remember Mum taking me through the streets after an air raid. All the houses had been bombed by the Germans. She told me that I had to go away because it wasn't safe in London anymore. I wanted to know why she wasn't coming. But she said she had to stay behind and wait for Dad to come home, or he wouldn't know where we were. The day I had to go was a Monday. I remember because I had to go and see the nurse on the Sunday after church. She was looking down her throat and putting her fingers through her hair to see if we had fleas. Mum took me to the station with all the other children from my street. There were so many and I didn't know them all. I had a case with my clothes and a package of biscuits and some carnation milk and my gas mask. I think Mum had put my ration book in my case. Mum laughed when I told her what my teacher had said because we practiced going to the station at school. She said that the streets would be full of expectant mothers. I thought she meant they were all going to have babies. But she meant they would all be expecting us to come home. At the station, there were lots of children getting onto the train. We knew we were going to the seaside. Some of the other children had brown tickets on their coats with their names on it, but I didn't. Mum said it was in case they got lost. I told her that it would be all right and I wouldn't get lost. I had never been on a train before. Mum was crying and lots of other mums too. I wasn't sure at first, but once we had set off, it was really good fun. The train kept on stopping and more children got on. Sometimes it stopped and some nice ladies would give us all a drink. Sometimes we went past other stations and we could see all the soldiers on the platform waving at us. When we got to the station, we were at Torquay and we had to get on a bus. It drove to a big school and we got out and the man took our names. Then we had supper. I'd never eaten so much. 
it was really good. When I was in London, I was always hungry. After supper, we had to go out again with our cases. There was a nice car and I had to go with three girls and a lady to see our new aunties. The first house we stopped at was in a street like our house in London. Two of the girls went with their auntie. She looked very happy and I hoped my new auntie would be nice like her. We didn't have an auntie in the town. We went to a house in the country, but it wasn't very far away. There were some other children with us. I wasn't afraid though. My new auntie was nice too, and she lived with her dad. They said I had to call him uncle. After we went to sleep, we had to go to our new school. Our old teachers were there to show us where to go. I had to write my new auntie's name on a card and send it to my mum so she knew where I was. The new school was different to my school in London, but it was all right. One of the teachers was a bit bossy. We used to play in the fields in the country, and sometimes we had picnics. Some days they took us to the seaside to play. There were lots of other children there then. I didn't stay in the country very long though. Mum and Dad came to see me and I had to go back to London. My brother was one of the sailors that had been killed in the war. Mum said she was very sorry she sent me off and I wouldn't have to go again. One night, Mum was crying in her bedroom. I think she was scared of the war. I said, don't worry, Mum, I'll look after you. But she cried even more. It was scary at times. I wanted to grow up and be a pilot like Victor. But now the war has finished. I suppose I'll have to stay at school. All I know is, thank God it's all over. I've got so many memories. War and death have been constant companions in this house for so long. Will this family ever be the same again? I don't think so. Poor Tom is no longer here. We've all shared in something that we never wanted or understood. Something we're never going to forget. Not as long as we live. Yeah, well, it was, a, it was a job, but it was no more risky than anybody else was doing. It was... No, it, it was no, no risk here. Everybody got a job to do. The engineers, the wireless up, the navigator, the pilot. You was a crew. Sometimes over places like Essen or Wilhelmshaven, uh, some of the heavily defended places, uh, you said a prayer or two, you know, but uh, we were young at the time and uh, death didn't mean very much, really. Unfortunately, I lost two skippers. The skipper I went to Africa with, they were, I was taken off that crew because an engineer became that, and the whole crew went. And that was a bit sad, but the saddest one was my own skipper that I finished my tour with. We were posted away to form a conversion unit as instructors and he went on an air test and they crashed into a hill and he was killed and that, uh, that was rather, rather the worst moment of my air test career because it was a great boat, a really great boat. Of course, if you happen to know anybody, it was, it was a very anxious time. I remember that uh, one young man I knew who was a wireless operator air gunner with a Rhodesian pilot um, in a Hamden, went off to Hamburg. And, you know, we hoped that everything would be all right, but unfortunately it wasn't, because I was on duty when the aircraft came back, and I knew that he wasn't going to come back. And, uh, I mean, you couldn't do anything about it. You just had to keep on carrying on, as it were. But uh, it was a most unhappy time. I, some of the nurses asked me would I sing to the boys that were going into pre-op. And that's a bit difficult because some of them have shots of morphine, you know. And I sang to some chaps and there was one boy who asked me to sing my Yiddish memories. His legs were gone and they'd wrapped him in sort of blankets but the blood was coming through. And the doctor asked me, did I mind? I said, you know, I said, did, did I mind? You know, there's a man sitting there with no legs, did I mind? I said, no, I said, you just carry on. And we went through the wards and we sang. And uh, they were wonderful. They, we still laughed, we still joked. 
in the main we remember the good times. There were many times we would like to have said, well, Jack is in and we won't, won't go, send someone else. But you were there and you, you just did it. Your mates were around you, your friends were around you, and uh, well, you just stood by one another and you did what you had to do. I consider myself extremely fortunate in the role I played. Um, thank God I wasn't in bomber command. Obviously I'm patriotic, but uh, I sometimes feel when, uh, about some of the lads that were lost, they died in vain. When you think about the situation in the world today. I think like most of us, we did it, we had to do it. And to say, was it worthwhile? Of course it was worthwhile. When you stop and think of the things we found out after the war, the films we see of Belson and the concentration camps. I think we would all do it again to stop that evil. When we were thrown into war back in 1939, whatever dreams I had were unexpectedly put aside. I replaced them with hope. Through the six long years of war, I experienced many moments that I have never forgotten. Like everybody else that lived through those times, I have many sad memories. I also have many happy ones. It is difficult for a younger generation to understand. Fortunately, they haven't had to suffer the anguish of being a nation at war. And for those of us that did share the experience, it will always remain a time in our lives that we will never forget. Memories do live longer than dreams.